So we've got one debate down and one more to go. So this is my pre-debate analysis for night two. And basically, I'm going to say the same thing that I think probably everyone is thinking. This is going to be a debate primarily between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. This is the Biden-Bernie show, and it would behoove any other candidate to insert themselves into that conversation, into that rivalry, and try to have a breakout moment because we all know that when you have the two front runners pitted against each other, that's basically going to pave the way for some fireworks. But if you can jump in there and either shit on one of those two front runners, you could potentially make a name for yourself. But what I'm expecting from Joe Biden, I'm very conflicted because on one hand, we know that he's a gaffe machine and he keeps speaking and pissing people off with every single word that he says. However, with that being said, I'm not going to say that he's an incompetent debater. So just based on performance, not substance, he could come out relatively okay. It's hard to predict. Bernie Sanders, I think, is going to perform well. I think he's got to hit Biden and hit Biden hard and constantly because Bernie knows this is a debate between him and Biden. He's got to make it happen. So in terms of what Bernie Sanders' method of attack should be, he's got to push electability because that's what they're pushing against him. He's got to make the case. Look, we went with the centrist last time. That's what Joe Biden is trying to position himself as. Do you really want to do that again? Do you really want to roll the dice? Or do you want to go with someone like me who energizes the base, energizes independents and young voters? If he can do that, he will win this entire debate. So that's what we have to see. Bernie hitting Biden hard. And for any other candidate, any of the eight other candidates, if you can get some attention and take it away from Biden and Bernie, you can be relatively successful. When it comes to Andrew Yang, I think he's going to have the easiest time because all he has to do is stay the course. If he has at least a minute to pitch UBI, that could help him. If he doesn't get that minute, which I doubt he, he'll you know, be completely excluded, but if he doesn't at least get a minute to pitch UBI, I think that's going to really hurt him. This could potentially help him. I think that for Andrew Yang, he's been slowly rising in the polls, and this could potentially be a breakout moment. He's definitely someone I'm watching. When it comes to Marianne Williamson, She's got to come with policy. Every time I hear her speak, it's platitudes. It's about love. Listen, if you don't come out swinging with policy, you're not going to go anywhere. Because even if she is someone who politically I agree with more than someone like, you know, uh, Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg even, she never talks policy. Ever. People don't know what she stands for. So she's got to put those platitudes aside come out swinging when it comes to policy, when it comes to Pete Buttigieg. You know, he had his moment in the spotlight. Now this is his chance for redemption. He's got to shine because he's been taking a beating because of the way that he handled a police shooting of a black American in South Bend, Indiana. He's got to try to redeem himself. He's got to communicate to people that he is sensitive to black issues. He's got to make a comeback if he wants any staying power, if he wants to perform well at Iowa. So I wouldn't say that this is make or break for him because I think he'll probably qualify for the next round of debates. But with that being said, what we're looking for with regard to Pete Buttigieg is potential redemption. Um, who else is going tomorrow? We have Gillibrand. When it comes to Gillibrand, what she needs to do and the way that she could potentially move up is if she outshines one of the other corporate Democrats. If she can outshine Pete Buttigieg, I think she's positioning herself well because she's been kind of overshadowed by these breakout stars like Pete Buttigieg and even Kamala Harris, but to a lesser extent. So if she can kind of slide in there and make herself known for something and get her word across, this could potentially help her. If she doesn't break out here then I think it's not going to go too well, you know, um, for the for the rest of the primary. When it comes to Kamala Harris, this is a bit tricky because what she needs to do is, since she is, I think, arguably one of the front runners, she needs to attack the person who she is positioned against. So she's trying to be a progressive. She's been very strong on Medicare for All. Not sure that I'm persuaded she'd actually fight for it. Nonetheless, you know, she's positioning herself as progressive. So what does she have to do? She needs to be an attack dog against Joe Biden. Tag team with Bernie Sanders. Her and Bernie should team up for purposes of this debate to bring down Joe Biden. And once 
they basically eliminate Joe Biden politically, or, you know, once he goes down enough in the polls, then they can clash with each other. But I want to see a ceasefire between Bernie and Harris because they're so close that it's in both of their interests to attack their mutual enemy, and that is Joe Biden. So if Kamala Harris does that, that's how I think she can win, although she does have to kind of stay the course in the sense that she doesn't want to be outshined by someone like Kirsten Gillibrand, who is ideologically kind of aligned with her, although a lot of Democrats don't like Gillibrand because of the Al Franken situation. She called on him to step down. She was one of the first to do that. And I don't know, like, of all things to be frustrated with her about, you know, it's the it's the Wall Street fundraisers. It's the fundraisers at the home of a Pfizer executive, big Pfizer executives. That's what I'm pissed about. I'm not angered that she cut out Al Frank, and I actually commend her for that because going against the Democratic Party is something that they will never forgive you for. So I'm not worried about that, and maybe they may never forgive her because they're just holding a grudge. But with that being said, Kamala does need to be cognizant of the fact that Kirsten Gillibrand could outshine her. Now, here's when it comes to a more tricky area. We have Michael Bennett, Eric Swalwell, and John Hickenlooper. These people are about as interesting as wallpaper. The only one out of these three that I can entertain even standing out is Eric Swalwell because he was smart enough to realize that he's got to pick one issue as his kind of go-to and he chose gun reform. So if he can really dwell on that and drive that narrative, he could break out, but it's going to be tough. John Hickenlooper, Michael Bennett, these guys don't stand for anything. Michael Bennett is someone who has been attacking Medicare for All. John Hickenlooper has also been attacking Medicare for All. And he's so pathetic that he's, in a way, I guess you could say, trolling Bernie Sanders by, like, responding to Bernie Sanders' tweets with his own campaign ads as to why Bernie's wrong. It's pathetic. So here's what I would um, <laughs> perceive to be successful for these people. If they can talk longer than, like, a couple minutes and maybe more than once then i think if our standards are that low it would be a success for them but either way i don't think that these debates will serve them well i think that they're just if somebody is opting for a centrist during this primary you're going for joe biden so i'm not sure what their place is and i don't even think they know what their place is but if they do they've got to make that pitch tonight and they've got to make it boldly and aggressively otherwise they're done stick a fork in them you've got like 20 centrists running in a field of so many candidates. I'm being, you know, um, hyperbolic, of course, but you've got already a ton of centrists. So if you're not proposing something unique, if you're not pitching a brand of centrism that is superior, you're done. So that's what they've got to do. John Hickenlooper, honestly, I don't like to make predictions. I like to kind of draw out certain types of scenarios that I think could happen. But if I had to make a prediction, if anyone's going to face plan, it's going to be John Hickenlooper. He just has zero charisma. And I really, really want someone to bring up the fact that he watched porn with his mom. Uh, 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 uh. Who I'm rooting for, you all know. It's Bernie Sanders. So long as he can pitch policies that are popular and progressive and shit on Joe Biden enough, that will be a success for Bernie Sanders. And really what this should be is the shit on Biden show. Everyone needs to attack the front runner because if you all collectively attack the front runner, that's not going to make it seem as if you are unilaterally going negative. If everyone is going negative, you have no reason not to go negative. So they all have a vested interest in attacking the front runner. Now, with that being said, I'm aware of the fact that if they all bring down Joe Biden, they're going to turn their attention to Bernie Sanders because that's what you do in these primary fights. You attack the front runner. But Bernie Sanders has already been undergoing these attacks. Um, for lack of a better word, he's battle tested. And I think that he can actually kind of stop some of their attacks. I don't know that Joe Biden will be as persuasive at doing that. I'd expect him to be called out for reminiscing about how, you know, nice and personable these segregationists that he worked with were. But that's what I'm looking for. It's got to be an all-out war on Joe Biden. If I can get that, then I will come away satisfied. But I'm looking for, you know, Bernie Sanders to shine more so than anyone else. But if any other candidate can kind of break into that Biden-Bernie fight, I think that will be a success for them.